The Inca built an empire that if placed over the old world would stretch from St. Petersburg to Cairo. They transformed a hostile landscape into an agricultural marvel and developed a culture with such respect for the dead that corpses were engaging in politics decades after life had left them. In this video, we will look at how the Inca adapted to their environment and became what British historian Felipe Fernandez Armesto called the most impressive empire builders of their day. Most of the Inca heartland is 3000 meters above sea level and has low rainfall, low temperatures and thin soils. It can drop below freezing every single month at this altitude. There is nowhere else on Earth, said anthropologist John Murrah, where millions insist against all apparent logic on living at 10,000 or even 14,000 feet above sea level. Nowhere else have people lived for so many thousands of years in such visibly vulnerable circumstances. The one advantage to this environment, though, was the enormous ecological variety. Due to the massive fluctuations in altitude, you can encounter more than 20 different life zones within a few hundred kilometers. The Inca used this to their advantage. A diverse range of crops was planted in different ecological zones and at different altitudes to ensure against famines caused by climatic changes or diseases, as not all zones would be affected similarly. Any surplus food was stored in warehouses controlled by the state for insurance against famine and drought, and a kind of freeze-dried potato was developed called chinyo to preserve potatoes in these warehouses for longer periods. As llamas cannot pull a plow very well, all plowing and farming was done by hand. Ancient Andean cultures soon realized that a large group could plow a field much faster than a single farmer. This soon developed into a complex system of reciprocity and cooperation, which became a pivotal trait to nearly all Andean cultures. In times of famine, supplies would be redistributed to those in need. Widows, the sick, and people too old for work were taken care of and had their lands worked for them. With such an extreme environment, the Inca had to develop these kinds of safeguards to ensure society ran smoothly. Total cooperation from all members of society was necessary, a trait which led to one of the strangest parts of Inca society, the complete lack of markets. It is hard for us to imagine, but the Inca civilization functioned nearly entirely without money. The production, storage and distribution of goods were wholly controlled by the central Inca government. Each citizen received and contributed food, tools and clothing to and from state-owned warehouses and needed to purchase nothing. Taxes were not collected in money, since there was none, and neither were they collected in other valuables. Instead, taxes were collected in the form of human labor, in a system called mita. Through the use of Mita, the central government could move workers across the empire and focus them on what the highest priority tasks were. Mining, sewing and construction are just a few of the tasks that were carried out by Mita workers. This is how the Inca were able to complete massive projects in their short 100-year reign. A primary trait of Andean civilizations is their relationship with llamas and alpacas, the only large domesticable animal in the region. Llamas and alpacas were essential to Inca society. They could not only help by carrying goods, but also by providing meat and, most importantly, cloth. This cloth was everything to the Inca. It kept the state functioning. It clothed the people, it functioned as a marker of rank, and well-made cloth was regularly gifted to people that pleased the emperor. Cloth was so tightly regulated that the government even issued people their outfits. Each province of the Inca Empire was given some of the state-owned herds and had to produce a certain amount of cloth each year that would be stored in the state-owned warehouses. The Inca warehouses, called Cucas, were built along the Inca highway system, one every 22 kilometers or so. An immense variety of goods were stored there, and they could be distributed whenever needed. The storehouses were a response to the challenges of the Andean environment. 
The lack of navigable rivers, wheeled vehicles, or large draft animals meant that goods couldn't be transported long distances easily. So these warehouses were constructed within walkable distances. They also allowed armies to march across the realm without weapons and equipment slowing them down as they could equip themselves at the warehouse closest to their destination. One of the most essential elements in the success of the Inca Empire was the remarkable system of highways extending for at least 40,000 kilometers. These highways had to pass over mountains, and frightening suspension bridges were common. Relay stations called tambos dotted the highway, stationed by runners or casquis. These were the fastest men from the nearby town who would run from one tambo to another with gifts, kipu or messages. This system allowed the Incas to send information across 392 kilometers in a day. The Roman Empire, even with mounted messengers, could rarely get a message over 320 kilometers away in a day. Along with these huge highway projects, the Inca cut through mountainsides building cisterns, terraces and irrigation canals to increase agricultural productivity. At the empire's peak in the 16th century, over a million hectares of terraces were in use. A terrace was constructed by building a retaining wall and then laying gravel, then sand and then soil on top of each other, forming a step. This captured water that would otherwise rush down the hillside and prevented flooding by filtering the water slowly. It also provided a way to stop crops from freezing as the stones would absorb heat from the sun and retain it through the cold Andean nights. In an environment where only 2% of the land is suitable for agriculture, the Inca transformed their heartland into an agricultural powerhouse. Finally, there's the magnificent Inca stonework. The Inca used perfectly fitted stones that could stick together without the use of mortar. They fit stones together like enormous jigsaw pieces. They were so well fitted, a pin could not pass through most of the joints. Major Inca constructions have also been found to be earthquake proof. These rocks were quarried, shaped and moved using mostly stone tools and rope. That is the physical Inca realm, but what was their spiritual realm made up of? The Inca believed wholeheartedly in the idea that the spirit realm and ours were linked, and that the dead could influence events in our world. One of the most unusual manifestations of this belief was Inca mummification. These Malki, as the Inca called them, were not the typical way to spend your afterlife. Only members of influential families were regularly mummified, and the corpse was treated as if it were living. They were fed, dressed and cared for as if nothing was different. In return, the dead would protect their families, maintain fertile land and ensure a steady supply of water. They were consulted in all critical life matters and asked about how to proceed during troubling times. The mummies of Inca rulers received an unimaginable level of care and respect. They lived an afterlife enviable to the living. Dead Inca rulers were meticulously preserved, so much so that the Spanish discovered people worshipping them long after the empire had fallen. Even in death, Inca nobles still maintained control of all their wealth, land and estates. What is odd to us made perfect sense to the Inca, as mummies were seen as living creatures. This strange belief contributed to both the rise and fall of the Inca. As the wealth of a dead emperor was not passed on to his successor, it was instead managed by their panica, which was a kind of royal family group tasked with preserving mummies. So new emperors could not use the wealth of their predecessor, and new conquests and constructions had to commence immediately to secure wealth and power. As all the good land around Cusco fell under the control of dead rulers and their strange mummy corporations, emperors had to spend significant amounts of time and effort on campaigns far away from the empire's center. This expanded the empire quickly, but allowed little time for consolidation. Competing panickers vied for power so intensely and ruthlessly that Machiavelli himself would blush and Medici would take notes. 
When the Spanish arrived, they would use these competing families against one another to weaken the empire. Despite all their monumental buildings and works, and despite the kind of guaranteed welfare that the Inca state provided, they were still plagued with revolts. Their empire didn't have a lot of time to consolidate their rule. When the Spanish arrived, the empire was barely 100 years old. Loyalties from conquered ethnic groups were fickle, and emperors had to deal with many bloody revolutions during their reigns. No Inca emperor dealt with more of these than Huayna Capac, who spent most of his reign pacifying newly conquered territory. However, he isn't remembered today as being the revolt-smashing emperor. No, he's remembered as the first Inca emperor to die of smallpox, and his death kicked off a massive Inca civil war just as the Spanish first arrived. Make sure to tune in to the next episode to see two great empires collide in an epic story of deception, resistance, and conquest. Thank you for watching this video in our series on the pre-Columbian civilizations. The next episodes will see the fall of the Inca Empire. We will then move on to the Maya civilizations to experience their epic rise and fall. If you enjoy this series, please let us know in the comments below. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us directly via YouTube by pressing the sponsorship button directly below the video. This is the Kings and Generals channel along with Kogito, and we will catch you on the next one.